I'm Dr. Tony Charles, who has a joint appointment in environmental science in the Sobey School of Business. He's the founding director and past chair of Canada's Ocean Management Research Network and an advisory, uh, sorry, an advisor to fisheries organizations throughout Atlantic Canada and around the world. Particular areas of interest are community-based conservation and resource management, small-scale fisheries, marine protected areas and indicator frameworks, and development of management measures for sustainability and resilience. Dr. Charles is the author of many publications, including Sustainable Fishery Systems, Canadian, fishery, Canadian Marine Fisheries in a Changing and Uncertain World, Community Fisheries Management Handbook, and his most recent Governance of Marine Fisheries and Biodiversity Conservation. As I get older, I try for shorter and shorter titles. Fish and Fishing Forever, basically trying to say three, three things. Fish matter, fishing matters, and we want it to last. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the theme that I've realized over time. I've been uh, more and more uh, keen on, I guess, is, is this mix of, uh, of the human side and the uh, ecological or nature side of things. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, 15,000 years of fishing activity in, um, in Nova Scotia, dating back, uh, and this canoe is not 15,000 years ago, but this reflects that cultural aspect of the Mi'kmaq that, that really does date back that far in terms of both hunting and fishing. Uh, if you look at the shell mittens, for example, around this region. So, you know, we have this long history, and then, you know, in more recent times when we have photographs, we've got, this is, by the way, from the Nova Scotia archives, a beautiful resource they have online for accessing uh, high-quality photos. Uh, so, you know, we have this history in this, in this region of fishing. Uh, then it got a bit out of whack in the, uh, in the 1900s in terms of overfishing, not blaming this boat in particular, but this is sort of representative of some of the more uh, industrial ways of looking that led about 25 years ago to what's often called the big cod collapse. And um, this is a diagram that, that kind of reflects a point where the fishery in this area was the largest in the world and then collapsed fairly rapidly. 1992 is this sort of key point in time where um, I, I kind of came on the scene somewhat in terms of of being appointed to try to do something about this, this big widespread cod collapse. And, and also that got me involved in looking at and working with people. Uh, up to that point, and I, you know, I, I'm not shy about saying that I was trained as a mathematician. Uh, a lot of people don't sort of know that now because I've kind of evolved in what I do. But I came from a point of where I sat in my university office or government office and did my thing with the door shut in terms of modeling and, and analysis. Uh, but after the cod fishery collapse, I kind of got more involved with working with, with people. So I, I want to um, just say a word, so that's where the fish and the fishing comes in. Um, I, I wanted to show you my props that I bought, brought along today. Um, this, this net here, this was a fishing net, is what caused the collapse, not of the cod fishery, but of the Peruvian anchovy fishery. But this, this net, you know, picture what can get through that net. Now that net's pulled through the water and mops up everything along its path. That's the proving, that before the cod fishery collapse, that was the biggest collapse in the world of a, of a fishery resource. This, of course, is a lobster trap, except if you know something about lobster traps, you can't perhaps see the scale of that photo, but you probably know that a lobster trap is bigger than this, right? <laughs> this would be the equivalent of if, if we were using this kind of trap, it would be equivalent of using that kind of net. Because you're, you're, you're mopping up the little critters as you go along. So, of course, this is just a tourist model, but, um, but it represents that idea of you've got to understand the biology and the technology and the whole package as you go along. Now, we have still a very healthy lobster fishery in this area. And part of the publicity for this talk was why are why aren't lobster extinct like the dodo bird? Think about that. Why aren't lobster extinct? People are off fishing it just like the dodo was hunted. The, the dodo was hunted to extinction. Why are there still lobster around? And partly it's because the people now know something about how to take care of the lobster. And in fact, the rules about lobster fishing were designed by the people that catch that lobster. I'm about to finish up here, uh, but I want to mention two things. Um, 
One is that we've also evolved, with this idea of fish and fishing forever, uh, to think about adding value to what we're taking out of the ocean. Part of that is what the Ecology Action Centre has pioneered in this area, community supported fisheries, actually other areas also have that approach. And, and to their great credit, they've just announced at Dalhousie, hopefully at St. Mary's will come as well, uh, an arrangement for the university to buy only uh, seafood that's sustainable from this off the hook program. Now this book, which I stole from the back there, but it's actually my book anyway, uh, <laughs> is, is a recent uh, product that we put out that tries to look at this balancing, this balancing act of fishing and conservation, how those go together. And um, I've done some other work that relates to parks in the province. So this, this was some of the stuff that, that I was involved with, with the provincial government in looking at parks. And I realized as we went along that um, this actually expands into some, this was an international World Parks Congress that took place last November. I had the, the good fortune of, of getting to it uh, in Australia. And this was, uh, this was like magnifying what we were doing in Nova Scotia, I don't know, tens of thousands of times, because this was looking all around the world at how parks connect with, and in this case, this is actually a marine conservation a document that I'm showing here, how marine parks or protected areas connect with uh, fishing activity. So how do you protect the ocean while fishing in the ocean at the same time? And that's basically my story, so that I think the way forward is connecting the people and the resources. Please head on upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>